The following program is rated M for a mature audience. It contains adult themes. America is in shock and in mourning tonight with one of the country's most famous streets turned into a bloodbath by a crazed relentless sniper, the hotel room full of high powered weapons. His motive is still not clear. He was 64, retired, a wealthy gambler whose only police record was a speeding ticket. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And in the wake of another insane mass shooting in the United States, the worst we've seen, everyone in the world, including the gunman's brother, has been grasping for the reason why. Believe me, I sympathize with everybody who's grasping. Who on this planet do you think is grasping for this understanding more than me? A week has now passed since Stephen Paddock turned his high-powered guns on Las Vegas country music lovers, killing 58 people and wounding almost 500 more. Yet the FBI admits it still has no clear idea why he did it. We must focus on facts. We cannot give in to conjecture and we cannot respond to every little Twitter feed that may indicate a theory. We need to focus on the facts. You need us to be right. But why wait for facts when rumour and conspiracies can fill the gap? And on YouTube, they have been flooding in, as The Guardian reported last Thursday. Videos questioning whether the shooting really happened and claiming that the government has lied about basic facts have already garnered millions of views on YouTube. YouTube, which is owned by Google, has 1.5 billion users worldwide and reaches 14.6 million Australians each month. And up the top of its search page last week were stories like this one, titled Las Vegas, quote, shooting, did it actually happen? Posted by Truth Unveiled, the video pledged to tell you what really happened in Vegas, which is, of course, that it was all a hoax or a so-called false flag attack. Once again, note the fake blood. No one was actually hurt from this event. It's all a show. It's all a stage planned ahead of time, just like with Manchester. It is crazy stuff, but that video was viewed by more than 390,000 people, and there were plenty more reaching millions in total. All this video, but no video of up close anybody falling or anyone anyone uh, uh, any blood or anything like that but it wasn't just youtube spreading this garbage the daily mail was also at it with a story claiming the gunman was an anti-trump extremist who had been praised by a melbourne anti-fascist group that had supposedly boasted one of our comrades from our las vegas branch has made these fascist trump supporting dogs pay Except that was nonsense too. As we told you in Media Bytes, the Mail's world exclusive was based on a Facebook post from a well-known troll site. And the Mail, which was caught by the same site two months ago, had made a fool of itself again. But pushing far harder with the claim that anti-Trump extremists were behind the massacre was America's notorious alt-right site Infowars. Could Stephen Paddock, the supposed lone Vegas shooter, have been a patsy to kick off the left's war with the right in the streets of America? Yes, another grade one conspiracy that had almost 900,000 views on Facebook and another 260,000 on YouTube within 24 hours. And InfoWars founder Alex Jones had plenty more where that came from. You had a bunch of people helping the shooter, if he was indeed the shooter, that he was not acting alone, we, that much we know. Police have said there was only one gunman, and they have no evidence so far that Stephen Paddock was anything but a lone wolf. But armchair sleuths have been tirelessly telling us the truth the mainstream media has been hiding. Like this revelation that Paddock was seen at an anti-Trump rally. Except it's not him. Or this revelation that he died in 2013, so couldn't have shot anyone. Except that wasn't him either. Well, this claim within hours of the shooting that the killer, whom they wrongly identified, was a left-wing activist. Las Vegas shooter reportedly a Democrat who liked Rachel Maddow, MoveOn.org and associated with anti-Trump army. That post on the far-right Gateway Pundit had first surfaced on the online forum 4chan. But as the story spread, it was promoted by Google and Facebook's algorithms to the top of Google searches and Facebook's Vegas newsfeed. 
And Facebook has also helped turbocharge a host of other Vegas fake news stories. They are being shared and viewed tens of thousands of times each hour, with no warnings whatsoever that they might be fake, and often no way for readers to flag them as fake news to the company, despite its pledge to do more to crack down on lies and propaganda. Indeed, where videos are concerned, as they are with Infowars, Facebook told courts last week that nothing can be done. Because the Jones post is a video and not a news article, there's no way for users to flag it right now as fake news, for it to be fact-checked, or for the company to attach related articles that might be more truthful. Given that video is seen as Facebook's future, that is pathetic. So, what can be done? Well, fake news can't be banished, but surely Google, Facebook and YouTube should not be pushing it the way they are. As the New York Times said last week, just because the war against misinformation may be unwinnable doesn't mean it should be avoided. Facebook, Twitter and Google are some of the world's richest and most ambitious companies, but they still have not shown that they're willing to bear the costs or the political risks of fixing the way misinformation spreads on their platforms. And we do have one piece of good news. YouTube announced on Friday it has tweaked its algorithms to favour videos from mainstream news sites after complaints from Vegas victims. We'll see how that goes. And talking of complaints, take a look at this ad in last week's Australian Jewish News. Sophie McNeil, Jerusalem correspondent for the ABC. Why the double standards? Palestinian Shemazne family evicted. Extensive ABC coverage. Salomon family stabbed to death during Shabbat meal. Minimal reportage. That ad attacking the ABC's coverage of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was taken out by federal Labor MP Michael Danby, who has a large Jewish constituency in his seat of Melbourne Ports. And seven days later, he was back for another crack. So, what's it all about? We'll come to that in just a moment. But as one political reporter noted on ABC Radio, the ad... ..is pretty extraordinary. I've never really seen an MP take out an ad personally attacking someone, and personally, in this case, attacking a journalist. And as Gartrell observed on Twitter, Mr Danby's leader also wasn't happy, not least because taxpayer funds had been used in the attack. But does the MP have a point? The nub of Danby's complaint is that two recent stories by McNeil received very different coverage. The eviction of a Palestinian family last month after a court returned their home to Jewish ownership scored a two-minute feature on the midday news. But the stabbing to death of three members of a Jewish family in July did not receive such personal treatment and was reported only in the context of a surge of violence in which four Palestinians were also killed. They did not get feature treatment either. So, is that bias or part of a pattern? Well, without an extensive audit, it is impossible to tell. Several Jewish lobby groups claim it is, but McNeil is adamant that it's not describing Danby's ad as... ..part of a campaign of attacks on reporters who refuse to kowtow to intense and intimidating lobbying and dare report the reality of what is happening here on the ground. The ABC has echoed that sentiment with regard to McNeil and backed her to the hilt, issuing a statement to say... The ABC has complete confidence in the professionalism of Ms McNeil. Her work has been demonstrably accurate and impartial. And the ABC has been supported by the head of the journalist union, Paul Murphy, who tweeted... McNeil does a difficult and dangerous job to bring important stories to Australians. Danby, he should pay money back. But that is unlikely to happen, because the Melbourne MP is a serial complainant and not just against the ABC. In 2014, he accused Fairfax Media's Paul McGough and Ruth Pollard of being anti-Israeli activists, even though both won journalism awards for the stories he singled out. McGough, he said, was biased, incompetent and willfully negligent. Pollard was polemical, one-sided and neither honest nor fair. But other reporters have also come under pressure. John Lyons was the Australian's Middle East correspondent for six years and recently wrote a book about his experience, devoting a chapter to the activities of the lobby. In my 35 years in journalism, I've never found so much pressure or heat when attempting to report about Israel. And that's due largely to the power of the Israeli lobby in Australia. And that's a subject that generally you're not meant to talk about. Lyons was clearly surprised and shocked by the whole experience. And he told ABC's The Drum... And I went there with the view that I'd been in Washington and New York, I would report it as I saw it. Mm -hmm. But every time I would write about settlements, something that's factual, 
you get targeted mm. as a journalist. If you write the truth of what you see in front of you in Israel and the West Bank, you will be savagely targeted. Reporting from Israel is a job that demands a thick skin, to put it mildly. But Sophie McNeil knew that from the start, as Lyons' book makes clear. Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council published a dossier which amounted to a comprehensive attack on her and wrote to the board of the ABC referencing it. The ABC's managers answered each claim, taking more than three weeks. And before McNeil got the job, the ABC's Peter Cave was also targeted by other Jewish groups, as John Lyons' book again reports. The group prepared dossiers on him. They took their case against Cave's bias to the Australian Broadcasting Authority. It took two years, but Cave was cleared of bias. Cave told MediaWatch that Michael Danby was in the vanguard of these attacks. Danby has been a serial complainant since the late 1980s, trying to force censorship on every ABC correspondent who's ever been posted to the Middle East. Peter George was the first, and every correspondent ever since has copped complaints from Danby. His complaints are half-truths and ill-based. We asked Michael Danby to respond, and he told MediaWatch simply... What I have always said about this issue is that reportage out of the Middle East should demonstrate equitable coverage of Israeli and Palestinian perspectives, not just focus on one side. If coverage by any media outlet has not shown that balance, I have spoken out, as any good local member would do. And in July, the executive director of AJAC, the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council, Colin Rubenstein, replying to claims made in Lyons' book, was also adamant that no apology is needed. We do critique journalists and media stories when we see factual errors, lack of context or unprofessionalism. The claim that such activities give us too much influence implies that something should be done about our ability to do them, even though they are part of our basic rights as participants in a liberal democratic society. Clearly a sign that the pressure will continue. And with Fairfax and News Corp no longer having a correspondent there, Sophie McNeil will bear the brunt of the criticisms. But now, let's lighten the mood and move on to an inspiring story about a young New Zealander. You wouldn't know it to look at her smiling face. But late last year, Olivia Odie couldn't use her legs. I just wanted to get up and walk so badly. She fought that fight for 12 frightening months. Some days I thought that this was going to be my life. That was a TVNZ report from March last year with the heroic tale of teenager Olivia Odie, who spent a year fighting a disease doctors could not identify. Until finally, a breakthrough. The wheelchair's days were numbered. Her mystery illness had a name. So it's complex regional pain syndrome and central neural sensitisation syndrome. You've had to practise those. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea what they meant. Odie is now fully recovered and lives in Brisbane. But she's moving to Byron Bay and starting a wellness blog. And last month, in profiling the aspiring writer, local paper The Northern Star revealed a shocking new explanation for her terrible ordeal. Teen left in wheelchair after Gardasil HPV vaccine reaction. Now that is important public health news. Hundreds of thousands of high school children are given Gardasil vaccine every year in Australia to prevent HPV and cervical cancer. So, did Odie's doctors tell her that it was Gardasil that had crippled her? Well, no. I definitely think there was a link, but there's no way to prove it, Ms Odie said. In fact, it seems her doctors were sceptical, because Odie also admitted to the paper... The proposition was controversial and... ..brushed aside by medical professionals. And it certainly is brushed aside. Out of 650,000 Gardasil jabs given in 2015, just 170 children reported side effects, or 0.03%. And most of those reported a rash that went away, or at worst, a day or two of flu-like symptoms. What's more, a 2015 European study explicitly ruled out any link between the vaccine and the chronic pain condition CRPS that put Odie in a wheelchair. But you couldn't read that in the Northern Star or any of the other News Corp regional papers from Mackay to Toowoomba that ran the story. And while journalist Alina Rilko did note that serious reactions to the vaccine are extremely rare, just three per million, the story's headline was scary and damaging. And in the opinion of Melbourne University virologist Dr David Hawkes... It puts people at risk because what it does, it puts them off vaccinations. It's actually hurting our healthcare system. Olivia Odie is a teenager who has been through hell and her recovery, documented in this Facebook video with almost one million views, has inspired many. We wish her well. And if she wants to blame the vaccine, well, that's her prerogative. 
But even she feels the Northern Star should have been more responsible in its reporting. My intentions with doing that interview was that I hoped I could help people by sharing my story. However, they used one brief comment I made and turned it into the headline, which changed the whole point of the story, in my opinion. We put the criticism to Northern Star editor David Kirkpatrick and he confessed they got it wrong. Telling me to watch. While the story accurately reflected Olivia Odie's health issues, the headline did not and has been changed accordingly. That's good. Better late than never. And you can read more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website. You can also catch the show on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And make sure not to miss Media Bites every Thursday. But for now, until next week, that's it from us. Goodbye.